Huh? Oh, come on. Come on. Boy, tough crowd. Security? Huh? Woo! Man, where's my friend Quinn? I got to bring my friend Quinn up. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to watch that message. We were illustrating um, what it means when you understand, come on over here, Quinn, when it's God's money and not yours. And so we gave Quinn some money. She didn't have any. Uh, we gave Quinn some money. And when she went to sit down, I asked her for a dollar back. By the way, I never bought your dad a donut with that dollar. And afterwards, I was talking to her dad and just question about it. And you know what Quinn did with that money? Now, I know she's going to get embarrassed, but she's so wonderful. She gave it away. Now, how cool is that? That How old are you? 11. She's 11, and she begins to understand what God wants us to do with our money. That is so awesome. Nobody asked her to do that. Nobody even gave her that suggestion. That was just from her heart. And so because of that, guess what? There you go. Thank you. Thanks. You can go sit down. And I'm not going to buy your dad a donut, so you just keep it. Why would we do that again? Because of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 11, when you give freely, you gain more. When you withhold, you become poor. When you give freely, you gain more. Now, don't everybody come up and say, hey, could I be part of that illustration next week? <laughs> it's an illustration. But you might want to hang around Quinn after church because she's probably going to give some of that away. Luke chapter 6, give and then receive. The amount you give determines the amount you get back. Your gift will be returned in full, overflowing into your lap. Overflowing. Not, she did not give because she had to give. She did not give because she was expected to give. She did not give in the hopes of a reward. She gave out of the goodness of her heart. She gave out of a cheerful heart. Folks, whether you give a dollar or a thousand dollars, it doesn't matter. God says, I'm looking at your heart. He compared a little old lady who gave probably two pennies to guys who gave thousands of dollars. And he said, you know what? That little old lady gave much more than they did. Because she gave out of a cheerful heart. And that's where God wants us to be. So when we talked about giving last week, we heard some just some phenomenally positive comments about that. It's about a cheerful heart. Look at 2 Corinthians 9. When you plant only a few seeds, you get a small crop. When you plant generously, you get a generous crop. So you're going to decide in your heart what to give, for God loves a cheerful giver. Man, such powerful truth in the Word of God. God has got a path for us. And when we stay on that path, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 5, we will live prosperous lives. How do we find out what that path is? The Word, Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is useful for teaching. Remember teaching? Showing me the path. I hope, you, I hope this is so drilled into your mind that you know exactly what this Scripture means. For showing me the path. It's used for rebuking. Guess what? Not guilt, shame, and condemnation. Not kicking you when you're down. But a rebuke from the Word shows me I got off the path. I got off the path. But God, again, doesn't kick you when you're down. Doesn't use guilt, shame, and condemnation. He uses what? Correction. And that correction gets you back on the path. And the training helps keep you on the path. So that Word helps us stay on the path. And when we stay on God's path, it produces prosperous lives. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a wholeness, a completeness in our life. And that's what prosperity is. So if you haven't listened to that message, I really encourage you to go back and check that out from last week. Like a supply, it's on our website, it's on our YouTube page. Catch it on our Facebook page as well. Let's finish this series today. This DIY series, you know what DIY means, right? Do it yourself. That's what this entire series has been about. Things that you can do yourself. Things that you should be doing yourself. Things you don't have to have a theological degree for or a seminary degree for. I don't have one. 
It's just about getting into the Word yourself and doing the things that God has for us so we can prosper and succeed. So today will be our last message in this series. Let's pray before we dig too deep into that. Father, thank you so much. What a joy it is to be able to come to you today with cheerful and joyful hearts. What a joy it is to be able to come to you this morning that hearts that have been tilled, that our worship time has prepared the soil of our hearts. And it's prepared the soil of our hearts to receive a seed that has the power to grow 30, 60, and 100 times more than what we planted. And so we thank you for that today, Father, in every single area of our lives. I thank you for the anointing that is on this message, the power of the Holy Spirit. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Labor Day confuse anybody? It, it confuses me. I mean, here is a day that we celebrate work by taking the day off. That just seems a little bit weird to me. And it's weird to me because I don't remember the last time I have taken a Monday holiday off. Uh, Memorial Day, Labor Day, whatever. I, I really can't take Mondays off very easily in the position that I'm in. Because if I take Monday off, then I'm a day behind, and that means everybody else is a day behind in the office. So normally I come in and work on Monday so I can continue to get my stuff done, the sermon notes, the devotionals, the study, the sermon itself, so that the PowerPoints and everything are done and are not a day behind. So I don't know what it's like to have a Monday off for a holiday. And I know that some of us are thinking, man, I just got to have a day off. I got to have a day of rest because our lives can feel a little bit like this sometimes. We just are trying to survive. You know, in the 1960s, a U.S. Senate subcommittee met, and they were talking about technology. And they said, you know what? By the 1980s, technology will so help us that the average worker will only work 22 hours a week in the 1980s. They said by the 2000s, because of technology, the average worker would only work 14 hours a week. And if you're familiar with George Jetson, in the year 2062, George Jetson only worked nine hours a week. Anybody finding that true in their lives? No. It, it's actually been almost just the opposite. The Harvard School of Business did a study of professionals and managers in Asia and Europe and the United States. And they said these managers and people in, in levels of authority and leadership in their companies worked or were basically um, monitoring work 80 to 90 hours a week. 80 to 90 hours a week. Harrison Ford, you guys know Harrison Ford, Han Solo, Indiana Jones. Harrison Ford lives in Jackson, Wyoming, really familiar with Jackson, Wyoming. He's got planes, he flies in and out of the airports there. Harrison Ford said, a man only wants what he ain't got, and I ain't got rest in peace. Rest in peace. The Bible is very clear that God desires to give us rest. Rest is priceless. If you could figure out how to bottle rest and sell it, you'd be a billionaire. So one of the things we've got to be very clear on today is that God wants you to have rest, but you will never find rest outside of God. You will never find rest in the activities that you do. You'll never find rest in entertainment. You'll never find rest in hobbies. You'll never find rest in money. The only place that you're going to find rest is in God. Now, we kind of talked about that last week in terms of, of money. Look at Exodus 33. God says, I will personally go with you, and I will give you what rest. Why do you have rest? Because God's with you. Psalm 62, I am at rest in God alone. 
Isaiah 32, my people will live in undisturbed places of rest. So if you're outside of the family of God, there is no rest. (laughs) And even if you're inside the family of God, there is only rest in God alone. Look at this scripture in Matthew chapter 11. Now, this is from the message translation. I I really, really think this says it so exceedingly well. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. A a nap on Sunday afternoon isn't real rest. God says, if you get away with me, if you hang out with me, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. How many of us take God to work with us? Learn the unforced rhythms of grace Keep company with me and learn to live freely and lightly. Man, that is a scripture that our whole country needs right now. Because things are nuts in our country right now. We need to be able to rest. And again, rest is only found in God. Hebrews 4.9, there is a special rest waiting for the people of God waiting for the people of God. Now, rest is so extremely important that in Hebrews 4, God tells us that our main focus, if we're going to make an effort to do something, that we should make every effort to enter rest. If you're looking for things to do, if you're looking to work, if you're looking for something to put your effort into in Christianity, it's to enter rest into rest. Now look what this says. The promise of entering his rest still remains, I fear you may fail to. The writer of Hebrews tells us that one of the things, now we know fear is not from God, but he says one of the things that I fear about your lives is you may fail to enter rest. Do you know how it (laughs) somehow... There's just a weird sense of telling people how busy you are. I mean, talk to people. And, well, I'm just, I'm busy. I'm busy. And they'll share with you how busy they are, and you have to one-up them and tell them how much busier you are than they are. I still remember a conversation. I, I, I was probably 10 years old. So that was, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. <laughs> and, right, Ryan? Yep, yep. And I had a bunch of my buddies in our driveway in Waterloo, Iowa, and we were talking about how busy our dads were. And it was somehow a badge of honor that that my dad was the busiest of the group. What a stupid thing. But we try to do that. We try to somehow think that, especially and even as Christians, that the busier we are, the more spiritual we are. So he says, I fear that you may fail to enter this rest. Grace didn't benefit him because it wasn't mixed with faith. Now, faith is the word pistis in Greek. Very simple definition. It means to believe. That's all it means. It's just to believe. We who believe enter rest. We who believe enter rest. I want to show you some pictures. I'm so thankful to Darlis and, and Haley for getting these pictures for you. Our son is adventurous, to say the least. Now, this is Mount Royal in Frisco, Colorado. And my son and a friend, Stephen, decided, you know what, let's fly out to Colorado and let's climb this. And so they spent almost 10 hours yesterday climbing Mount Royal. Let's see a couple of other pictures here. Maybe another one. And one last one. Now, when he told us that, 
a week or so ago, what's probably the number one option for a parent? Panic. <laughs> Panic. Worry, right? Fear, right? And so we have that opportunity to be in panic, to be in worry, to be in fear. Do you know what that is? It's works. I got to work to worry. I got to work to panic. I got to work to fear. And so, as we've told you, we, we pray for our kids regularly. We've been praying for Timothy for this trip specifically, Just praying in tongues for him on Friday morning. We prayed with Elaine and I Friday in, in the midday, prayed with Jessica and Elaine and I Friday night, prayed Saturday morning. We were praying for him. What specifically? Well, Psalm 91 is a really good one. He dwells under the shadow of the most high, the shelter of the most high and the shadow of the Almighty. No harm can come to him. And guess what it says later in that in that scripture? That the angels will lift him up so his foot will not even strike a stone. How appropriate is that? So we prayed for him. Now, he called us halfway up this thing yesterday and actually FaceTimed us from halfway up this. And then he called us when they were done and they were walking back down. And you know, I said to Elaine later, I had even forgot he was doing it. Didn't mean I didn't care. It just mean I wasn't worried about it. Why? We, go back to the scripture up there, Darlis, we who believe enter rest. So I believe God's word. Elaine believes God's word. What does God's word say? God's word says that no harm will come to him, and God's word says that the angels will lift him up so his foot doesn't even strike a stone. Is that true or not? Well, when you believe that, you can be at rest. God says, you know what? I don't lie. And he says, not only will I show you that I don't lie, I will swear an oath by myself, because there's no one greater than me to swear it by, that I'm telling you the truth. I swear that to you. But if you're going to walk in unbelief, you're not going to enter rest. It's just like money. We talked about money last week. We talked about how money is God's and everything that you have is from God. We saw scriptures earlier today. When you give, you will receive more. If you withhold, you'll become poor. Now, folks, if you grab a hold of those and believe those, guess what? You will enter rest in the area of your finances. It's as simple as that. You will enter rest when you believe. And so that's the choice that you and I are going to make. You will never enter rest without believing God's Word. You will never enter rest without having a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. It's just impossible. Now, is it easy? No, it ain't. Look at what it says in Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 says, The Lord your God will give you rest. Your warriors... Fully armed must help them conquer the land until the Lord gives them rest. It's not a piece of cake. There is a battle. There is a fight. There is a war going on to try to prevent you from entering God's rest. So it is a fight to believe, right? Faith is a fight. It's a good fight because you win. To believe God's word is a fight fight. It is a fight. You need some warriors to walk with you in this thing so that they will help you to believe. They will help you to enter rest. Man, if you're walking around and hanging around negative people, you will never enter rest. You got to be real careful who you're hanging around. You got to be real careful to the things that are coming out of their mouth because the vast majority of us have a tendency to to speak death. Even wonderful Christians like your pastor. Why? Because it's natural to us. So we have to fight to be willing and able to speak life. And we've got to look and say, God, you said this. Am I going to be in fear and worry? No, I'm going to rest. Look at Psalm 95. Do not harden your hearts. Hardening your hearts is unbelief. 
So don't be in unbelief. Why? If you're in unbelief, you're not going to enter my rest. Hebrews chapter 3, they were unable to enter, enter what? Rest because of what? Unbelief. They couldn't enter God's rest because they didn't believe God. Hebrews 4 again, we who believe enter rest. The rest is there. The rest is there. But even some who receive the good news, even some who heard, you're hearing the good news right now. There are people who are going to hear this message and they're not going to be able to enter rest because they don't believe it. They don't believe it. Man, there is a rest out there for the people of God, but you're going to have to choose, do I believe what God says? And when you believe what God says, then all of a sudden you can enter this amazing rest. You know, Hebrews is, is an interesting book. There's, there's a lot of things that we may or may not understand in Hebrews. Do you know that for the first 11 chapters of Hebrews, the only sin mentioned is unbelief? The only sin mentioned is unbelief. So when he talks about in Hebrews 10, when he talks about those who willfully continue to sin, there is no sacrifice for sins left. You know what he's talking about? Those who willfully continue to, uh, to be in unbelief. How can there be any sacrifice for sins when you don't believe? So Hebrews, when you're talking about the book of Hebrews, the main focus of Hebrews is about unbelief. Why? Because they were dealing with the people who didn't believe that Jesus has come as the Messiah. They were dealing with a bunch of Hebrews, a bunch of Jews, who couldn't make the transition from religion to grace. They couldn't make that tradition. Why? Because they didn't believe it. It's not about coming to church. It's not about giving. It's not about serving. It's not about reading. It's not about any of that. Are those good things? Those are wonderful, wonderful things. It's not even about being a Christian. You know, you can be married and not have an intimate relationship with your spouse. You can be married and not have an intimate relationship with your spouse. You can be a Christian and not have an intimate relationship with Jesus. And so it's about more than doing all the things that we're supposed to do in this Christianity. It's about are we going to believe. So let me give you five things from that passage in Matthew 11 that will help us focus more on how do we receive rest. Number one, come to me. Come to me. Get away with me. Walk with me. Work with me. Keep company with me. Basically, I'm going to boil it down for you. Hang out with Jesus. Hang out with Jesus. Wherever you go, hang out with Jesus. You're going to the coffee shop with some friends, invite Jesus to come along. You're going to work, ask him to be with you throughout the course of the day. You're going to play golf, you're going to fish, you're going to shop. Ask him to accompany you during whatever activity that is. The, the Jews, they thought they, they would find rest if they obeyed all of the 600 and some odd laws and regulations in the law. We can't even keep 10. So good luck with that. Good luck with trying to find rest through keeping all of the law. Folks, there is no rest under the law. There is no rest trying to obey the law to be right with God. Man, I've been there, I've done that, it doesn't work. Most of you have been there, done that, it doesn't work. Because you could do 599 of them, and you can't get the 600th one. There's 613. But you can't get that last one. So guess what? Now you're walking in guilt, shame, and condemnation because you can't get that last one. So no matter how good you do, it's never good enough. It's never good enough under the law. There is no way you can possibly be right with God under the law. Look at Acts chapter 15. 
Why are you burdening believers with a yoke that neither we or our ancestors could bear? Now, yoke is the word zugos, and it literally means the Mosaic law. Why are you burdening believers with the law that no one, not us, not our ancestors, could handle? We couldn't do it. So Luke comes in and tells him here in Acts 15, Luke wrote Acts 15, he's saying, all right now, why are you doing this? It, it doesn't work. You're just adding a burden. We've been made right with God through Jesus Christ. That's how we have peace. That's how you get rest. Galatians 2, no one is ever going to be made right with God by obeying the law. No one. And those commands that Jesus gives us, they're not a burden. Whenever you see a command in the Scripture, if it's a burden, you're looking at it under the law. When you, when you look at the law, law creates demand, grace creates supply. So I can look at that same command in the Bible, one, under law, I can feel tremendous guilt, shame, and condemnation and burden, and one, I can go, oh my gosh, look at all the supply God has given me to accomplish this command. Amen? If you want to go back to money, we can look at that and how it fits together with money perfectly. Oh my gosh, I've worked so hard and now God wants me to give him back. What a burden it is to do that. Or, oh my gosh, look at all the abundant supply God has given me and I get to give some back to him. This is incredible. So grace takes away the burden of the law. And the key to all of this is the key is resting in the finished work of Jesus. Folks, it's not about you. You don't become right with God through what you do. You become right with God through what he did. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Talio in Greek. It means to bring to a close. It means to fulfill. It means to accomplish. It means to perform the last act which completes a process. The process of making us right with God was done through Jesus Christ on that cross. And so if you're trying to do some things to make yourselves right with God, it will never happen. It will never happen. And so you have to begin to come back and look at the Scriptures and see what Scripture says. <sighs> One of the saddest things that I do as a pastor is meet with people who are usually elderly, not always, but 85, 90, 95 years old, and, and they're on their deathbed. They're, they're ready to go home and be with Jesus. And this has happened so many times in my life, I can't even tell you. And I'm meeting with these people, and I'm talking to them about their life, and the thing that they are concerned about the most is if they have done enough to get to heaven. Have I done enough? And they will rattle off to me their accomplishments. They will rattle off to me, well, I, I, I was the treasurer of our church, and I taught Sunday school for 50 years, and, and I provided for my family, and I did this and this and this and that, and they still don't know if they're good enough to go to heaven. It breaks my heart. And so what I do, I point them back to the cross. Point them back to Jesus. You are God's beloved. He is fully pleased with you. You are perfect. You are holy. You are righteous in His sight. The reason you're going to heaven is not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And when you accepted that, that was your guarantee that you were going to heaven. And they focus on past sins, and they focus on, well, I did this, and well, I did that. You know what? Psalm 103 tells me that one of his benefits is to forgive all my sin. And all means all. All means all. So you and I have to know and understand and to, if we're going to enter rest, you have to believe that what Jesus said he did, he did. You have to believe that all of your sins are forgiven. You know what? The punishment for our peace was laid upon him. So if I believe that, if I believe that, yes, there was a punishment, 
And that punishment was to bring me peace, but that punishment was not on me, it was on him. And if I can believe that the punishment for my peace was on him, guess what? I can enter rest. I can enter rest. Because it's not about me, it's about him. But you will never enter rest until you believe what God says. And there's rest in all kinds of areas of our life. There's rest in the area of our finances. There's rest in the area of our health. There's rest in the area of our children. Man, there are some parents who believe if they don't worry about their kids, they don't love them. That is a lie. That is a lie. The Bible says, do not worry about anything. But we somehow think we're not a good parent. Even when I was talking to Elaine yesterday, I said, this is going to sound weird, but I really haven't thought about Timmy all day. And he's climbing this huge mountain. There are some people who would tell me what a horrible parent I was. No, I just believed God's word and we entered into rest. And it was interesting. Both times that Elaine had said something about Timothy, he called within 15 seconds. Unbelievable. Call within 15 seconds. We were sitting around the table last night. Shouldn't he be down off the mountain yet? Bam. Phone call. Unbelievable. But that was rest that came from me believing what Jesus has said. Yes, absolutely. We're created to do good works. Man, we should be doing good works. We should be doing things out there that show people who we are and whose we are but they will never bring you rest. Good works don't bring rest. Good works don't please God. Faith does. Good works don't please... Does that mean you shouldn't do them? No, I'm not saying that. Good works don't please God. Faith does. Isaiah 64, 6. Man, if you've been here in the last 15 years, you've probably heard me talk about this verse 50 times. All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. It doesn't say all of our sins. It says all of the good things that we do are like a filthy rag to God. Definition of filthy rag, women's used menstrual cloth. Because when a woman is is having her time, she can't reproduce. And God does not want us to reproduce good works to try to be right with him. Good works are are not something that is going to make us right with him. So he doesn't want that teaching and that doctrine to reproduce. Doesn't want that doctrine to bear fruit. So yes, created to do good works, Ephesians chapter 2. But you know how we do those good works? Through grace. Through grace. Through the supply of what God has already given us. And so when you can begin to see that, and you can begin to say, that's there in Scripture, I believe that. The righteous shall live by faith. And so I'm living by my belief. And I'm living by my belief in the word. And as I'm doing that, guess what? I'm entering into rest. I'm entering into rest. I I, I trust God. Why? Because I believe what he says. And so I can go take a nap while my kid's climbing a 1,500-foot mountain in Colorado. Why? Because I trust God. I can enter into this rest because I believe what the Word of God says. Amen? So again, we, we can get temporary rest from a lot of things. I love going fishing. It's a great time for me just to be alone with God. There are some of you who like to go hunting. There are some of you who like to, to knit or to read or to shop or whatever. Wonderful temporary rest ability. Wonderful things to recharge us. But again, rest only comes from God, and it comes when we believe. But if you're asking, well, pastor, is there anything I can do that will help me enter into rest? And the answer is yes. Let me give you this definition. It's highlighted in your notes. And underlined, rest is Holy Spirit-directed activity. Rest is Holy spirit directed activity. There are days when you might be out and you might feel like, man, I need to buy the ice cream cone for the person behind me in the drive-up. And so you do. 
and there are days that you won't. There are days that you'll feel like going and helping a neighbor, and there are days that you won't. We do that through the Holy Spirit's direction. I I can't give you a list of ten things for you to check off and say, if you do these ten things, they will enter into rest. All I can tell you is we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. If we look at John chapter 4, Jesus came in and it says, Jesus sat down and it says he was worn out and he was weary. Now if you look at the King James version of this, it's really cool. It said, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Other versions say, he needed to go through Samaria. Now, he didn't need to go through Samaria. He didn't have to go through there to get where he was going. But the Holy Spirit was telling him, go through Samaria. And so Jesus comes into this place. He's at the well. He is worn out. He is weary. He sits down. The disciples go off to try to find something to eat. And this woman comes and starts talking to him. She's been married five times. The guy she's living with is not her husband. And she starts out talking to Jesus, man, sir, Lord, and then all of a sudden she comes to know he's the Messiah. The more she sits and talks to him, the more he is revealed to her. Now, she goes back and literally changes her whole town. She evangelizes the whole town. And when the disciples come back, there's Jesus popped up and ready to go. Here Jesus has some food. Nope, I don't need your food. Why? My nourishment comes from doing the will of God. So Jesus went from being completely worn out to a Holy Spirit-directed activity. And at the end of the Holy Spirit-directed activity, he was refreshed and ready to go. Amen? Galatians chapter 5. You look at Galatians chapter 5, and you see that the Holy Spirit wants to guide your entire life. And when you operate under the works of the flesh, the works of the flesh lead you to this whole huge long list of really icky stuff. But when you follow the direction of the Holy Spirit, it says the Holy Spirit will produce in you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit produces that in you. And where does it come from? Following His lead. As you follow His lead, the Holy Spirit produces these things in you that allows you to then to go out and do good works and in the midst of it, rest. Because you followed Holy Spirit-directed activity. Paul says, I want the Holy Spirit to be involved in every single area of your life. Every single area of your life. That's where we're going to find true rest. And when you follow the Holy Spirit, and you live according to His plans and His direction, when you stay on that path, trust me, every day will be like a holiday. Amen? Take out your communion cups. The bread is on the top. Just pull off that top. Oh, if you do not have a communion cup, would you raise your hand and Jesse will bring you around a communion cup. This is another in... in, Another piece that just shows us that the work is finished. What you hold in your hands is proof that the work is finished. You've got a couple more over here, Jess. Thank you. And so we hold some bread. We hold some juice in our hands today. Jesus said, this is the reminder of the new covenant. This is the reminder that the work is finished This is the reminder that as you believe in me, what are we believing in as we take this today? Well, we're believing that all of our sins have been forgiven, and we're believing that all of our diseases have been healed, because that's what the Word says.
And so we enter into that rest when you believe what God says. So, Father, thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Thank you that as we take this bread today, it's a reminder of what Jesus has done. And in Psalm 103, he tells us that one of those benefits is that our diseases have been completely healed. Father, we believe that today as we receive this bread. Father, we thank you for the cup. This is the blood shed for the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we no longer have to walk around and worry and wonder if all of the things that we have done have been forgiven, because they have. How do we know that? Your word tells us that. And as we can rest in the promises of your word, as we believe that, it will help us live lives that honor and glorify you. So, Father, we thank you for that promise today, that the benefits of what Jesus has done is to forgive us all of our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us today. Thank you for opening truth to us today. We thank you that there is a rest created for God's people, and we enter that rest through our belief in your word. Thank you, Father, for showing us these things today. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you're in our college young adult ministry, we'd like you to head downstairs. We've got walking tacos for you today and Pastor Joe's famous Rice Krispie treats. And so we're inviting you to lunch and some time of fellowship together basically within the next 15 minutes or so. Thank you. I'm going to stay up here today. I just kind of sense there might be some people who need prayer. Uh, So if you'd like to come up for prayer, uh, please do that. Thanks so much. See you next Sunday.